I've entitled this talk antibiotic withdrawal in agriculture. Are we there yet? Because I feel like this is something we've been talking about for years, but we just we're not quite there yet, even though, you know, we're all trying and different technologies are in the pipeline. Um, so as a place to start, antibiotics, um, they were discovered almost 100 years ago, so we've had them for a while, and they're used to treat bacterial human infections. They've saved countless human lives, and they're also used to boost agricultural productivity. Um, but as early as 1945, we started to see antibiotic resistance. Um, so are the antibodies normally, the antibiotics normally kill bacteria, but the more the bacteria are exposed to the antibiotics, the more they have chances to evolve resistance. Um, and we used a lot of antibiotics, both in human medicine and in agriculture over the last hundred years. So there's a lot of antibiotic resistance out there. Um, over the last hundred years, we've developed several classes uh, of antibiotics, but we have seen resistance develop to all of them. There's no antibiotics out there right now that don't have some sort of resistance towards it. But the thing that you really have to remember is that the more antibiotics we use, the quicker resistance evolves. So there's almost like a budget of antibiotics that we can use before resistance evolves. So it's a question of how much do we want to use in agriculture versus how much do we want to reserve for just human medicine and saving human lives. Um, so to be clear, uh, we've been saying the antibiotic resistance crisis is coming for you know a, a couple decades now, but it is here now. So about 700 people die annually of antibiotic resistant infections that cannot be treated with any of the antibiotics we know about today. This number consistently increases every year. We never see a year over year decline. We always see a year over year rise in the number of people dying. Based on our projections of how fast this number is rising, we're guessing that by 2050, about 10 million people a year are going to die of antimicrobial resistant infections. In perspective, about uh, 1 million people died during the first year of COVID. So this is a really big number. Um, this is gonna cost our global economy about $100 trillion by 2050 because there'll be missed time off work, we'll have travel restrictions. Um, it's just not going to be fun. In addition, I don't wanna take the wind out of COVID sales because it's been really bad, but there's no simple solution to antibiotic resistance. There are different types of infections with different pathologies and different etiologies. So a single vaccine or a single new drug is not going to help the situation. There's multiple types of infections, and this is a very complex and hard problem. Where are these deaths gonna be? Um, they're gonna be in parts of the world that are already suffering inequities. Uh, Africa and Asia will take the bulk of the antimicrobial resistance deaths, um, You know, each almost half. Um, with Europe, North America, and Latin America being, you know, not bearing the brunt of this. But make no mistake, this is a global problem. These bugs move routinely. Um, so something surprising, of the antibiotics that are produced every year, 70 to 80% by volume are used in agriculture. Uh, most of it's used in meat or other animal-based product production. You can see the little globe um, on one part of the slide here showing how many milligrams of antibiotics we use per kilogram of meat produced. Some countries use a lot more than others, um, but this is per kilogram of meat. So some use more in volume because they produce more meat. We use this amount of antibiotics in agriculture because we've switched to a very intensive style of agriculture. Um, so this is a picture of a farm in California where 800 acres is used and 250,000 cows pass through that 800 acres annually, which is very high density farming. In this dense environment, there's stress, there's infections, there's a good opportunity for infections to jump from animal to animal, and therefore antibiotics are used to keep the animals healthy in this type of environment. Um, so one of the questions is, is it worth it? Like, let's just stop using them tomorrow and we'll figure it out. It doesn't really work that way. Um, 
for a lot of reasons, doing with uh, animal welfare and productivity issues. Um, and there's an argument that if we just start eating animal protein, this would all go away. And that's probably true, but it's not a switch humans are willing to make before 2050 when this is really going to be quite bad. Um, so it's better to solve the problem than trying to make hypothetical, you know, questions about what we're doing. Um, so before the use of antibiotics, the dairy industry had 95% more mastitis infections than they do now. Mastitis infections are very painful for cows and reduce productivity in our dairy industry. So if you know, if we eliminate an antibiotics, we're subjecting the dairy cows to a lot more pain than we would have if we're using them. Antibiotic growth promoters, so just speed at which animals are growing, increase bo body weight in chickens by about 18% or by about 8% and improve feed efficiency by about 5%. Um, so that's actually a big number when we're talking about chicken growth. And it's also affecting mortality rate. So in no antibiotics chickens, so chickens that you raise without antibiotics, you have a mortality rate during the growth period of about 4.2%. This is compared with about 2.9% if you're raising conventional broilers, so broilers with a little bit of antibiotic. Might seem like a small number, 1.3% difference, but the United States produced 10 billion chickens last year. So that's 130 million chickens that were extra in mortality rate with the no antibiotics. And this is sad, you know, for the chickens, for their deaths, but it's also a more drain on our agriculture. It's grain that you produced that you don't get to eat now. It's uh, carbon emissions that you had from harvesting the grain to feed the chickens that don't go into your food supply. It's the water that went to water the chickens that are not in your food supply. So it's a bigger productivity issue. Also, birds raised without the use of antibiotics have higher indicators of poor welfare. Their eyes are burnt, there's lesions on their foot pads, and they have air sacculitis, which all indicate they're not as healthy as the birds that are getting the antibiotics. Um, so I don't think we can keep doing this, but at the same time, there are a lot of arguments that it does produce, improve agriculture. So the problem that we work on in my lab is that we obviously need to reduce or remove antibiotics from agriculture, but we still have to keep our animals healthy and we still have to produce enough food to feed ourselves. So what my lab focuses on is can we modify the microbiome of these farm animals so that they're resistant to infection, they grow faster, and we just don't need the antibiotics. They can be saved for use in human medicine. And one of the ways we started to do this was we started the bovine microbiome project. So bovine mastitis is a bacterial infection of the mammary gland. You can see there's swelling here and inflammation because this uh, quarter is infected. It's painful for the cow um, due to the inflammation. It's difficult to treat because a lot of it's intracellular infection and hard to get at with antibiotics. And this infection costs Canadian dairy farmers about $665 million annually, which is a lot. It's likely closer to a billion US dollars in the States because um, you guys have more cows than we do. Um, it occurs 95% less today than when prior to when we had antibiotics. So this isn't necessarily an issue of concentration agriculture. It's an issue of just, this is an area that's prone to infection. If we banned antibiotics today with no alternative, it would cost somewhere between 46 to $73 per cow. And this would likely be too high of a cost for most dairy farmers to sustain. So what we're doing isn't sustainable, but banning antibiotics is not sustainable at the moment either. Uh, this is also the cause for most antibiotic use on dairy farms. So if we could fix this problem, we would fix the problem of antibiotics for the most part in dairy farming. So our initial hypothesis for this study was that the microbiome differs significantly in the others of cows that are resistant to bacterial infections versus the quarters that succumb to bacterial infections. And that we can exploit these differences to develop a teat deep or a topical probiotic to provide protection against these infections without actually relying on antibiotics. So it was a cool study. 
And our students went out to dairy farms, uh, five across Quebec, every two weeks for 14 months. And they collected four samples, one from each quarter, uh, from about nine or 700 cows. So they had 27,000 samples in all. And any cow that had a mastitis infection, they looked at what was causing the infection using moldy tough and identified the organism. Um, they found cows developed all types of different types of bacterial infections in their quarters during our 14 month study period. Um, we're still working on a lot of this data, but we're done the Staph aureus study. So I'm gonna tell you about Staph aureus um, quarter infections now. Um, so these 10 cows got Staph aureus. The red dots indicate a Staph aureus infection. The blue dot indicates an infection with something else. And all of the black dots are a healthy level quarter. So what we did was look at the microbiome in these weeks prior to the first mastitis infection and looked at the microbiome and how it recovers afterwards. Uh, one of the first things they saw was that the microbiome was different between herds, but this is fully expected. They're in different locations eating different food, but they weren't all that different and there was a lot of overlap. So the differences could actually be exploited to allow us to look at patterns that were consistent between all of the five farms that we looked at. Um, what they observed was that the microbiome had a high level of diversity, both in healthy quarters and in quarters that would later succumb to mastitis until two weeks before the initial infection. Two weeks before the animal got sick, the diversity completely dropped. So the microbiome became sick before the cow came, became sick, which is a good indicator of illness and could possibly be exploited for diagnostics. But then we saw by four weeks post-infection, the microbiome was recovering and did recover eventually. But what were the differences in those low diversity microbiomes? So what they did was plot somatic cell count, um, which is a measure of inflammation, which is a measure of how bad your infection is, against the relative abundance of different types of bacteria. And what you can see here is there's some um, quarters that are incredibly healthy. There's no inflammation up here. But you have a population of nearly 100% of some of these organisms, even though that quarter is outrageously healthy. Um, and when we looked at these on a genus level, we saw that Staphylococcus and Aerococcus were both part of these microbiomes of extremely healthy cows. So we're thinking that these could actually be really good probiotics. So we took some of these quarters that were very healthy but had low diversity and did metagenomics. So we sequenced all the genes there so we could get this to a species level. And what the species were, were Staphylococcus xylosis and Aerococcus urani. So already we have an estimate that these two species might actually be very effective at preventing mastitis. So we went back to our original samples again and tried pulling isolates of each two of these out. We eventually got isolates and when we streak them on a plate, so this is a lawn of Staphylococcus aureus from a bovine mastitis case um, and some control organisms. But what you're seeing is the Aerococcus urani that was counter-correlated or negatively correlated with Staphylococcus infection actually does completely inhibit growth of Staphylococcus aureus. So this is an excellent probiotic candidate um, that came from a natural cow, from a natural environment and can prevent the growth of Staphylococcus aureus, so could be very useful in a probiotic teep deep. Obviously, we're still working on this. We're gonna try and pull 20 strains that are all negatively correlated with different bacterial pathogens as we develop this product. But I think this initial result and this little band on this plate shows us that this, actu this idea is actually feasible and we might actually be able to modify the microbiome of cows to negate the use of antibiotics in dairy farming. Um, so the funders of this project, uh, thank you very much for the funding. I have a great lab that has a lot of fun uh, working on their projects and hanging out. And I'm always welcome to collaborations or any other questions, uh, either through Twitter or email. Uh, so thank you very much.